Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for this time of Bible study. Thank you, Lord, for our time in the word, that you would be glorified in all that is said and done. In the mighty and precious name of the Lamb, we pray and we said amen and amen, amen and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so tonight I am indeed <clears throat> encouraged in the Lord. And I'm asking God's hand to rest and rule and abide upon us. And so tonight we're going to continue on in our study of the Revel book of Revelation. We're going to deal with the church of Pergamos tonight. And my heart, everything that I've been doing with the word, God has just been flooding my heart and lifting me up. Um, and I feel that there's a transformation taking place. And so, and so tonight, let's go to Revelations, the second chapter. And we'll jump in at the 12th verse. And I feel like I just need to set, settle back on here. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write these things, saith he, which have the sharp sword mm, with two edges. The revelation right here, first of all, the angel is the pastor of the church. He's writing to the angel of the church. He is putting the pastor on edge or on notice. He says, he says, write these things, saith he. And who is he? He's Jesus, which have the sharp sword. So, so listen to this. He says he has the sharp sword. Sometimes you have to read, read what it says to see what it didn't say. Because sometimes what it didn't say reveals more about what he said. So what he said here was this. Right, the, the one who has a sharp sword. In other words, there may be some that don't have a sharp sword. Huh? There may be some that has a sword, but it doesn't have two edges, it has one edge. So I need you to understand that Jesus is the one, he is the word, but he and the word is our sword, but he says it is a sharp sword. And why is it important that the sword is sharp? so that the word can be preached because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We must have faith towards God. And yet we cannot have faith towards God without the word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And yet the sword needs to be sharp. In other words, the sword needs to cut. And if it's got a double-edged sword, it cuts one way, and then it can cut the other way. So the word needs to be sharp. So it can bring us, so it can make an incision, an incision into your life, an incision into your situation, an incision. Ah, oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. So that when the word makes an incision, it is to bring about so it can make, after it makes an incision, it wants to make an excision. In other words, there's some things in our life that need to be cut out. There's some things in our life that need to be cut off. Now, let me say this. You don't get to be the one that decides what is and what doesn't get to cut be cut off or cut out. You may recognize, and if you do, then you can say, you can say what the Lord has told me is true, or what the Lord is trying to cut out of my life is true. But the Lord is the one that says this or that needs to be cut out of our life. Why? Because too many times we will choose something that is good. And not everything is good is good is God. Sometimes what is good is just what's good to us. 
Sometimes what's good is what just makes me feel good. Sometimes what's good is what just tastes good. But, but, but God says not everything is good is God. Not everything is good comes from him. So he makes an incision so that there can be an excision. But the problem is, is that sometimes we won't let the Lord cut on us. Because I, like I like it the way I like it. I got what I want. I got it the way I want. And it is just that. I'm liking it. Right? But God wants to make an excision in our life. I want you to ask yourself tonight. Are you willing to let the Lord make an excision in your life? Even before he makes an excision, he's, he's got to make an incision. Are you willing to allow the Lord to make an incision? Now, this is the revelation. You see, the incision could hurt. Oftentimes, have you ever been cut and before you got cut, you didn't even feel the pain until you saw the blood? but some people aren't willing to go through the pain of the incision. Why is that important? It's important because you have to choose which pain you want to go through. I know someone who had a sick child one time and they took the child to the doctor and the child was so sick that the doctor needed to give him a shot. He was in pain. He could hardly breathe. He was having all kinds of issues. His life, if left unchecked, could be in danger. But when it came time to give the child the shot, the father and mother took the child to the, to the doctor. And all of a sudden, the, the mother saw them come in with the needle. She kissed her little boy, got up and walked out the room. And then the father was left there with the doctor, the nurse, and the child. And they, they said, we've got to give him a shot. And immediately when the child saw the, the, the needle, the hypodermic needle, the child went ballistic. Suddenly, this child that didn't feel good that they were trying to hold down the child. And they tussled with this little child for quite some time. And finally, the father grappled with the situation. Do I keep doing this because it's hurting my child? Or do I let the doctors and let and, and, and let the doctors give him this shot? Or do I save my child from this momentary pain? But he decided, I've got to make the choice now. I've got a choice to make the decision in terms of what pain am I going to choose? Because if the child doesn't get the pain, he's not going to get better. And invariably, he could lose his life. But what, what pain do you choose? I say to you tonight, what pain do you choose in your life? It's one thing to say, yeah, I know I got this or that. And you know it's not good. You know it's not healthy. But you know it's going to hurt to make a change. You know it's going to hurt to, to get what you need. And you can choose to get what you need. Or you can say, nope, I'm not going to do it. And stay where you the way you are. And therefore, it becomes more destructive in your life. Well, what happened? This, this, this is the, and this is a true story. So then the father holds him down. They give the baby the shot. Immediately after they gave the baby the shot. They open the door. Mom comes walking in. 
and she holds her baby. She begins to comfort the baby and the doctor gives them some instruction and then they go outside and they go to get in the car. Mom buckles the baby in the car seat, in the back seat. But, but then instead of getting in the front seat, she stayed in the back seat to comfort the baby. And dad, he's driving home feeling hurt because of the experience that, it, that he had to go through and he had to hold the baby. And now mom and baby are in the back seat. She's comforting him. And then they go home and he thinks, okay, everything's going to be all right. They get ready to take a, to, to, to lay down and take a nap. And mom and baby go get in baby's room in the bed and they lay down and take a nap. And daddy's looking like, what about me? And it was about what pain do I choose? Well, obviously they got past that moment, but he had a pain because he needed to make a choice. So I say to you tonight, let me back up. Are you willing to make, well, let me say it this way. It, it's, not, it's not even a matter of, are you willing to make a choice? But what choice will you choose? Will you choose to stay where you are or will you choose to let God do what? Make an incision. See, unlike that baby, nobody's going to hold us down and say, I've got to do this for your own good. But you got to lay there and you got to let God make an incision so he can make an excision. And he makes an incision so he can make an excision so that um, so that he so that after he makes an excision, it is so that your life so that you can come to a place of a decision. Amen. God wants to make a decision in your life. Amen. Will you let the Lord have his way in your life? Will you let the Lord magnify himself in your life, in every dimension of life. Amen. Amen. So I say to you, what pain will you choose? You got to let the Lord make an incision so that there can be an excision so that you can come to a place of a decision. Let's go on. Verse 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is and holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith. And even in those days where Antipathus was my faithful martyr. So in that church, and let me say this. So this church uh, was the church of Pergamos. And I, I want you to know that Pergamos, if you will, has, you know, it's a compound meaning, but it says fortified or an elevation. So Pergamos was a place that was fortified, built up to be strong and had an elevation. So we need to hold on because sometimes we find ourselves if you will, in that situation. He said, I know that, that Satan has a seat in the church or a place of influence, and we cannot be those that will allow, if you will, Satan to have influence in the church. We must, and, and guess what? Not only in the church, but in our life. If Satan has an influence in your life, you must come to the place that you that you render it powerless, that you that you avow, 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 that you overthrow, 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 and you give it back to what God is saying. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. There were those that were faithful and were willing to die for the gospel's sake. And so I say to you tonight, are you willing to die for him? And if obviously the next question is, then why won't you live for him? 
In other words, stop playing church. Stop being ever learning and not able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But come back to that place where I'm willing to, uh, uh, to be transformed and not conformed. We brothers, we're starting off uh, at Men's Fellowship this first Sunday in September, and we're going to meet the second Thursday of September, and we're going to go through this book, The Dis Discipline of a Godly Man. Why? Because we want to be transformed. We want our minds to be renewed. Amen. And so, so on the first, it will be in person, but on the Thursday, it will be via online. We want to get to the place that we're being transformed. Transformed in the name of Jesus. Letting the Lord have his way. Man, I've just been talking about one verse. I know thy works and where thou dwellest and where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name. That church held fast to the name of the Lord. And has not denied the faith even in those days where Antipasus was my faithful martyr. Who was slain among you? Ha! Huh? You knew him. They were right there in your face and they were slain among you. Hmm? They were slain among you. And so this is the deal. This is the deal. They were in relationship with this individual. Not somebody I heard about, but somebody I knew. I heard about, hallelujah. So let's go on. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast therein them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. We cannot live a life of compromise. We cannot live a life that says, there's a there's God's standard and then there's our standard. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them which hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat the things sacrificed unto idols and commit fornication. You know what? I've been examining my life and I've been drawing ever closer to God. And I'm letting God turn over every stone. I'm letting God deal with me in every area of life. Amen. Every area of life. Amen. We're in the book of Revelation, the second chapter, 14th verse. And once again, these seven churches, they were actual churches in that day. But today, they are churches that represent the nature. Hear my heart. You know what? I've been loving our morning prayer. Man, you talk about a sacrifice. Amen. It's one thing to say, I'm going to get up and I'm going to have prayer by myself. And I'm just going to go sit in the corner and, you know, have my quiet time with God. But God has been using this to transform my life. I've been enjoying God's word more than I've ever enjoyed it before. And God is causing there to be revelation like never before. 
you know, our sonship students on, 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 on Monday night. I mean, man, God is doing something and, 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 and what, you know, this, this past Monday, if you will, when we were in class, it was so profound. And I knew that God was going to drop a powerful word even before the class started. Let me continue on. So thou has them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, Latians, which I hate. Right? He said, he says, you got them which I hate. And there's not there's not many things that you find that God says he hates, right? But here God is saying, okay, I, 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 I hate, I hate these Nicolaitans, no lotions, right? Uh, the word Nicolaitans means destruction or people, destruction of people. So their 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 thing was to destroy the people. There are some people who are just haters and their purpose, their plan is to bring destruction. They're not trying to build up. They're not trying to do anything positive to reinforce. But he goes on and he said, repent. He's saying return to the high point. He said, repent, change your mind, change the way you feel about your life. Some people feel like the longer they be, they've been saved, they almost get to the place that they don't feel the urgency to repent. But I've come to the place that it seems like more and more every day I feel the need to repent. Because I'm not leaning on my own righteousness. Because my righteousness as a filthy rag. But I know that I must seek the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And I must allow my life to be changed and transformed. And so therefore, I must be a person that has a heart to repent. Why? Because I'm seeking God. I'm de de dependent upon God. I need God to move in my life. And I'm surrendering all things to you. Lord. And I'm asking you to do the same. When you come to the place that you could surrender all things to God, you begin to say, God, there's not one area that I won't let you be Lord over. See, sometimes we live our life and we're not willing to let the Lord, we'll let him be Lord over, over several different areas. But sometimes we come to a place that we say, ah, you know, ah, uh, I'm not going to let you be Lord over that area. Now, now you, you're not foolish enough to say that, but your actions speak louder than your words. God says, give it to me and let me fix it. Or let me cut that out of your life. And you're like, nope, it's mine. Or nope, you can't take care of it like I can. And God says, look, surrender all. He's saying, look, give it to me. Let me have it. Let me deal with it. Hmm? Search your heart. Is there any area, the way you walk, the way you talk, is there any area that you're not willing to surrender to God? Now, I'm not asking you to testify. I'm not asking you to, to tell everybody, you know, what that area is. Is there an area that you struggled with surrendering to God? Hmm? 
And if that's an area, I'm asking you to bring it to the king. I'm asking you to bring it to the Lord tonight. Let the Lord have his way. Take me to the king. My life is your is my offering. I am the offering to God. And as I've as I'm coming into this dimension of sacrificing and yielding more and more to God, I feel as though the Lord is rapturing me. He's drawing me closer. I feel like He's overcoming me. He's overtaking me. Let the Lord have his way in your life. We as preachers, as the preacher, we must not be immoral or allow the people to go and just without, without preaching the word, live an immoral life. In other words, we're going to tell them, hey, it's wrong. We're going to preach the word. We're going to tell them that there is a there there is a standard that God wants for us to live by. And we do it by the words that we that we live by. And what are the words that we live by? It's this right here. The B I B L E. Basic basic instructions before leaving earth. See, I love uh you know Come on. I, I, I wish somebody could break out with the song, Take Me to the King. Hallelujah. He said, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly. I'm giving you a choice. And I'm asking you to repent. And I will fight against them with what? The sword of my mouth. He's going to fight against those who do not repent with his word. And he that have an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying unto the churches. In other words, every church the spirit is speaking to. And we must be a people that will hear what he is saying to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and give him a white stone, a stone, a new name with a new name written, which no man know, know it saveth he that receiveth it. So we must heed the warning of the Holy Spirit today. Hmm? We must continue to speak the same word that Christ spoke to the seven churches. Why? Because there's an urgency for the word to be preached. Commanding us to do what? Overcome sin. The sin in the, of the world. And to become more and more intolerant of sin. It's funny how sometimes we'll be intolerant of, 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 of some things that we will tolerate in our own life. Or sometimes sometimes we won't say nothing about, about some things we need to be intolerant because we don't want nobody to say nothing about me. Is he ministering to anybody tonight? We need to let God have his way. We need to let the Lord minister to our souls. Because if we fail to overcome, if we fail and deny the power of God, amen, God's favor and presence will come to an end in our life. So you got to make up your mind that you're going to overcome. You got to make up your mind that you're going to let the Lord have his way in your life. Let 
Let me say it like this. Like the church of Ephesus, some of us lost our first love. And he told us to repent, and now you're being reviled. In other words, you started off on fire for the Lord. And somewhere along the way, you lost a little steam, and you just began just living, and you just began churching. In other words, I go to church, or I just I read my Bible, or this, that, and the other. But you really stopped somewhere along the way of true transformation in your life. And you're just going along with what externally looks good to, to those that you show it to. But we must come to the place of repentance. And we must come to the place of overcoming. If on the other hand, we overcome, we'll receive the hidden manna of spiritual life, hidden manna of blessing in your life. The white stone stone signifies triumphant victory of our faith, triumphant victory of those who sought to destroy us. The enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy. But God is calling us to a place of repentance. He's calling us to a place of victory. I just want you to lay your heart bare before the Lord. I just want you to let the Lord have his way in your life. Let the Lord stir your heart tonight that you will overcome, that you will lift up the bloodstained banner in your life. that you will let the Lord move on your behalf. God, I love you. God, have your way. God, I trust you. I trust every aspect of my life, my family to you. I ask Heavenly Father, Lord, that your will would be done. Hallelujah. I ask the Lord's will to be done in your life, that you will come to a place that you will repent and that you will turn back to the Lord in every area that you will allow the Lord to minister to your soul in Jesus name. Hallelujah.